May the Lord add a blessing to the hearing and the preaching of his word. But who is Jesus? You know, that's a question that many people are still discussing in our days. And the answers are many. Some people say Jesus was just a man with a good philosophy in life. Others say he was a teacher and a prophet. We Christians, we believe and we confess that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. But the point is that the identity of Jesus is still a common debate among people. Even in the scriptures, we see that over and over again. People repeatedly questioned who Jesus was. For instance, you may remember that after uh, calming a big storm, the disciples wondered, who is this man that even the wind and the sea obey him? Because of his teachings and testimony, the Jews asked, who are you? You may remember that during his trial, Pilate repeatedly asked Jesus, who are you? Are you a king? Where do you come from? And as we read in the scriptures this morning, the answers in regards to Jesus' identity varied, even in biblical times. So we just heard that Jesus was in the region of Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi. And I got to tell you this, this is one of the biblical passages that locality, location is very important. You know, this city was the center of pagan religion in the land of Israel. The Greeks had built a great worship center in this area. And then the Romans dedicated a temple to the worship of Caesar. So what you see here is perhaps a picture of what looked like back then, this area where this is taking place. place. To the right, you'll see the temple the Romans built to honor the emperor. And to the left, you will see the temple the Greeks built to worship their many, many, many deities. And actually, it is in this area, it is in this environment where Caesar is claiming to be a god and where the Greeks are worshiping their deities that Jesus asked two questions to his disciples. One, who do, you, who do people say the Son of Man is? And number two, who do you say I am? Actually, it is believed that Jesus was very close to these two temples. Some people say that he was standing right in between of these two temples when he had these conversations with his disciples. And I got to tell you, if this is the case, Jesus' actions are very revolutionary because Jews tried to avoid this place at all costs. The blasphemous activities that took place in this area were repugnant to the Jews. So they never came by. Thus, the actions of Jesus of coming to this place reminds us that he came to seek the lost and the sick, not to avoid them. And by the way, for that I am deeply grateful. Because I've been lost and I've been deeply sick. So let's say Jesus was nearby this pagan worship center. In fact, the reason to locate Jesus near this idolatrous complex is found in the words of Jesus. After Peter made a great confession, Jesus told him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will be build my church and the gates of heaven. Hades will not overcome it. You know, what you see today is the actual picture of how Caesarea Philippi looks like. And actually, what you see here is that a cave that stood behind the temple that was dedicated to the Roman emperor. And this cave back then was known as the Gate of Hades. And it was believed that the Greek deities during the winter descended to Hades through, that, through the gates of Hades and kind of hibernated. And during the springtime, people did crazy, crazy stuff, friends, to wake 
up the deities. They were so crazy that I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to even mention any of them. But you can Google it and read it. Crazy stuff. So it's not really hard to imagine Jesus using the actual scenery to share a powerful message with his disciples. In between the temples, right in front of the gates of Hades, Jesus is having this powerful conversation with his disciples. So I want us, I want us to take a look at the conversation. Jesus raised a couple of questions. The first one, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, from the text, we know the disciples' answer was a good statement that they were very familiar with the street rumors about Jesus. They knew very well what people were saying. They said, some people say you are John the Baptist, others say you are Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. However, Jesus wanted to know about what kind of identity his followers knew him. Then the question became more personal. What about you? Who do you say I am? You know, every time I read this episode, I am reminded, dear friends, that the question, who is Jesus, invites us to examine our faith and beliefs. Many times we go through life with a borrowed faith. We repeat what others are saying about Jesus and we do so with little to no personal convictions. I have seen people in church who have been grandfathered into the faith. And I don't know if you are, get what I'm trying to say. There are folks who are very familiar with what others around them are saying about Jesus, but they cannot give a personal statement of faith. You know, as Christians, our relationship with Christ is informed by the tradition of the church. However, such a relationship is more than a collective set of agreements. Our faith in Jesus has to go beyond what we learn from others. There has to be a personal element. Our faith may find its beginning as we learn from others, but at some point, it has to be owned and shared from the heart. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to do. In this story, I see Jesus moving his disciples from who do people say I am to who do you say I am. And friends, here is the truth we need to really embrace this morning. At some point in our faith journey, we have to make the same transition. We have to answer Jesus' question, who do you say I am? We have to make a personal statement of faith. So Jesus boldly and directly asked the disciples, Who do you say I am? And I guess the twelve were in shock and speechless. Like some of our children this morning. Hmm. What should I say? I think this was just the right time for people to clear their throats. <coughs> And as they looked at each other, Peter came up with the answer. And Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And I want us to take a few moments to think about this answer, dear friends, because it's very important that we understand what Peter is saying at this moment. I say Peter gave the best possible answer because it is true that Jesus was a prophet with great teaching skills, with the best philosophy in life, but the highest title Jesus shows is Messiah. We gather to worship more than a teacher or a philosopher. History is full of philosophers, prophets, and teachers, but none of them have promised eternal life. None of them have said, I am the way that leads to life. None of them have been named Savior, because the Bible says that there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved, Jesus Christ. There is only one Savior, and his name is Jesus, who is the Son of the living God. Are you with me? Say amen. amen. I want you to see the gravity of Peter's words, because in just a few words, Peter is making a summary of the nature of Jesus. Number one, he is the Son of God. He is divine. And number two, he is a Messiah. He has a purpose. 
and that purpose is to save. And of course, after such a good answer come praises and recognition and compliments. So Jesus said to Peter, you are blessed. You should be rejoicing. You should be happy, Peter, for what you said no one told you. You didn't get the answer out of the books or from others. You spoke not under the influence of other people. You are not repeating what others say. You should be happy because no one made out of blood and flesh instructs you to speak like this. But here is what I really like about this part of the scripture. And what I like is when Jesus tell, tell Peter, you should be more than happy because you dis receive disclosure from my Father in heaven. You are greatly blessed because you have received revelation from the living God. You know, God revealing to humankind is all over the Bible, dear friends. Moses got to know God because God revealed to him in the midst of a burning bush. Samuel got to know God because God revealed to him in the middle of the night. Deborah got to know God's plans because God revealed to her. And the examples are many. But the point is that we get to know God by revelation. Has God revealed to you? That's a question we need to ponder. That's something we need to seek. You know, perhaps you know Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. Maybe you know Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. Perhaps you have experienced the inexplicable peace of God's shalom. The truth is that God wants to reveal to all of us. God wants us to know him personally. Are you ready to receive revelation from the Father in heaven? I believe that we should be the church that strives for God's revelation every day of our lives. I am convinced that a personal revelation from God without intermediaries is something that we all should seek. I strongly believe that the best time to receive a word from God, to hear the voice of God, is where, when having a time of personal intimacy with the Lord. You know, Sunday morning shouldn't be the only moment for us, for us to receive a word from God. If we want to be blessed, we have to seek revelation from God at all times. And that's what Peter is, is happening with Peter at this time. He's receiving revelation from God. And that's why he's able to recognize Jesus as the Son of the living God, who is the Savior, who is the Messiah. But the, the answer, the conversation goes on. And Peter, after he replies, Jesus said to him, you know, great answer, Peter. And I got to tell you, on this rock, I will build my church. There are some people who believe that Jesus is referring to Peter as the rock where the church was to be built. But I, I do believe that Peter was not, nor is the rock. Jesus is the rock where we can be established as a church. Jesus is the cornerstone. He is our fortress and our salvation. He is the rock. King David once wrote, For who is God besides the Lord, and who is the rock except our God? The psalmist wrote, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. The point I want to make, dear friends, is that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. He is salvation. He is the rock. Jesus was not saying that Peter was a rock. Let me translate verse 17 for you. Jesus replied, You should be more than happy, Simon. You are blessed, for you have received revelation from my Father in heaven. And I tell you, that you can be as sure as your name is Peter, that on the confession you just made, I will build my church. What Jesus is saying to Peter is this, you can assume that whoever believes, proclaims, and confesses that I am the Messiah, the Son of the living God, is the church. Any person who confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, is the church. That person is the temple of the Holy Spirit. When I am approached by someone asking me what to do to become a child of God, my answer is as simple as, you must confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I like to make emphasis on the verb confess because it conveys a deeper, a deeper meaning that, than say or tell. 
You can say some, something and don't mean it. You can even teach certain animals how to say things, but they will never know what they are saying. However, confession is different. Confession has to do with convictions. There is no loose talking in confession. People confess the truth, beliefs, things, they hold on to it. And when you confess that Jesus is the Messiah, the, the Son of the living God, you are recognizing, you are declaring, you are believing and holding on to the truth that only in Him you can find salvation and eternal life. So Peter is saying, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Number one, you are God incarnate. You are the one who saves. And Jesus said, well said. On that rock, I will build my church. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Now, from a historical point of view, we know what that meant at that time, right? Jesus is standing in front of these two big temples. And we later know, uh, we know that later the Romans will try to crush Christianity, right? To make it dust. But Jesus said it, the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. It's the great news, dear friends. There is nothing that can stand against us. Because the Bible says that if God is for us, who can be against us? Having Jesus as the Savior, as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, give us assurance, a solid rock to stand on. But not only that, friends, it gives us also a lot of responsibility. Because as Jesus continued with his compliment to Peter, he said, Yes, the gates of Hades will not overcome the church. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. We as a church, we as the people who proclaim Jesus as the Son of the living God, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, we have been given the responsibility to help the lost and disoriented to find the door that leads to the heavenly mansions. Remember, Jesus is in this place of pagan worship, and he's there with a purpose. He's there on purpose. He wants us to know that he came to mingle with the messiness of us human beings so that we can be transposed to the path God wants us to be. And as people who proclaim Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, we have been entrusted with the keys of his kingdom. And God wants us to open the gates of the kingdom of heaven to those who don't know him. We are the key that God wants to use to bring them through the doors and help them grow, friends. The Apostle Paul in the, in the end of Acts 13, citing the command of the Lord, says, I have made you life for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Friends, this word commissions us, gives us responsibilities, and encourages us, and is a promise that we have to fall back, that we can fall back on. There is blessing, there is power, there is authority when we call on the name of Jesus. He is our foundation. Those who confess that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, are members of the body of Christ. And as members of the body of Christ, we have been given joy, we have been given authority, we have been given assurance and responsibilities. I just pray that we all may be the people who fully confess. Jesus, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Let us close it in prayer. Lord, we know that we cannot confess you unless we receive revelation from you. We pray, Almighty God, that you will reveal to us this morning and every single day of our lives. Draw us closer to you. Help us to know you personally so we can tell the world who you are. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. They may not know it, but they are hungering for Jesus. They may not know who is the one that can really feel and satisfy their soul. I got to tell you, I know who that person is. His name is Jesus.
So as we go out into the world, you will find people who may not be asking the question literally, who is Jesus, but are hungering to know Jesus. May you tell them who Jesus is. Prince of Peace, Lord of all, everything, mighty God, Holy One, the great I am. Let them know that Jesus is with you and with them. Share the good news. And as you do that, may the peace of God be with you. Always, until we meet again. Amen.